Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Randy Fields on the line, and he is founder and CEO of Park City Group, known for one of its core products, Repositrack. Randy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. All right, Randy. So uh, we have a big topic today. So when you and I were preparing for this interview, I was like, you know, I've done a lot of interviews, but I don't think we've ever really talked about um, supply chain trends, specifically in food safety, which is interesting to me because food safety, I mean, first off, one of the biggest industries is retail, right? Retail food, but food safety affects us all. So I'm excited to get into the nuances of, you know, changes that are happening um, and trends. Um, but before we do that, we'll start this interview the way that we do them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, Randy, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. Randy, what mission matters to you? Well, it's it's problematic from where we are to, to even uh, begin to cover the, the real mission. But the fact is we see the world having adopted uh, an inverted supply chain 25 or 30 years ago. Yeah. We would like to be uh, of value to at least the food industry in improving on a whole series of frankly poor decisions made around how to run a supply chain. Yeah. And at the, same, at the same time, inherent in supply chain, uh, which really focuses on how much product should move between a buyer and a seller, there's really what we call the antecedent question, which is, should you buy anything from that seller? Mm -hmm. Should, as a buyer, you buy product that's likely to make your customers sick or kill them? And the answer is obviously no. So we see compliance management, we see food safety, et cetera, as all part of a supply chain activity. And we'd like to make at least a small contribution in getting people to do it better than they're doing today. It's great. And uh, love bringing mission based uh, entrepreneurs and executives on the show to really share why they do what they do, like what motivates them to go out into the marketplace and, and into the world and to make a difference. So great to have you on. And uh, maybe just to get us started, um, tell us a little bit more about your background and maybe how you got started on this entrepreneurial journey. Uh, I think I'm what's called a serial entrepreneur, meaning and that serial with an S, not a C. I've actually only had one job in my life, and that was when I was 16 years old, and I worked for a company for about four hours before they decided I wasn't a good fit. The whole four, huh? <laughs> yeah, so I, yeah, so I think I've always been an entrepreneur. Uh, some of your listeners may know my previous incarnation, which was Mrs. Fields' Cookies. And so... I have a, a long career in retail, and it was actually in the context of Mrs. Fields Cookies mm -hmm. that we developed what was certainly one of the world's first real-time supply chains, where uh, it, when we sold a cookie at the front counter, that triggered a series of supply chain activities that, yeah. that produced a very interesting replenishment system. So my first venture really was uh, in retail, Mrs. Fields Cookies, uh, we sold that in the early 90s, and I at least thought about retirement. That didn't yeah. work. So we began to look for how we could apply what we had learned in the world of Mrs. Fields around supply chain, and vast amounts of data and timeliness. How could we apply that to uh, other industries that needed it? And our conclusion, strangely enough, was that the retail food industry in the U.S., Mm -hmm. which is actually the largest industry in the world, interesting to know. Mm -hmm. The largest industry in the world was extraordinarily rich with data and terribly poor with information. They were drowning in data. Mm -hmm. So we applied our technical skills, if you will, and managerial skills to develop some things that we think have been quite helpful to the retail food industry. So um, just, uh, you know, there's some going to be some people watching this and just for context for everybody that's uh, that's that's tuning in. I mean, we're recording this in uh, in January of 2022. So that being said, um, you know, you're as a serial entrepreneur with the S, not the C um, as a serial entrepreneur. 
you know, there's some people out there that are thinking about this entrepreneurship path, or maybe they were even um, displaced and now they're on this entrepreneurship path without even knowing they were going to be on it. Like obviously a lot going on in the world right now. What kind of things would you say, obviously with the benefit of, of hindsight right now, being on this journey for so long and, you know, with some of the successes you've had, like for example, Mrs. Fields Cookies, um, what kind of things would you tell to that next group of entrepreneurs that are out there right now trying to, going through it and really just trying to make it? Well, you won't like my answer, and I apologize in advance. I personally think that entrepreneurship is a socially acceptable form of compulsive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm -hmm. um, it's some manifestation of, of, a, of truly mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure I would encourage people to be entrepreneurs, yeah. but what I would say is for those who have that bent who who feel that compulsion to do something like this something in business um it's that recognize that the consequences are not all beneficial so yeah. it, as a result then it's personal family things like that that, that yeah. pay the price for what you're doing so i think to a certain extent it's important to have something in your mission, either personal, personally or business-wise, mm -hmm. by which you recognize that you're just, a, if you will, you're just a vessel or a vehicle. And now the question is, yeah. ultimately, what difference do you make? So a lot of entrepreneurs think it has something to do with making money, nah, yeah. or something to do with God knows what. But at the end of the day, if you're lucky enough to be blessed with with the financial success that that compulsion leads to frequently, uh, the real question is, what's next? What do you do with all of that? Mm -hmm. um, and that leads to some great soul searching, to be to be sure. So I wouldn't encourage. I certainly wouldn't tell my children that a great great lifestyle is called being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, but um, if you have it, if you've got the disease, and there's nothing else you can do about it, <laughs> then. Uh, <laughs> Randy, I, I love your answer. And just so you know, and I don't I don't take this personally, but you must you don't watch my show often because I always say what you I don't I don't explain it quite the way you did as a mental illness, but I always say who would sign up for this pain? Like it's hard. And it's oh, yeah, like, no, no. Yeah, like and it's, it's so much pain. And it's not like you see the end result sometimes, but everything behind and for the for the true like people that have been in it, like, and they understand what it takes to do and what they, maybe they a little further along in their journey, like, and they see somebody that's been successful or started something or had an idea from scratch. It's almost like, it's almost like you relate on that level of, oh, you signed up for the pain as well. Like, you know, it wasn't easy, no matter what you read or see or anything, like it wasn't easy. There was a lot of pain involved in that compulsion towards it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. I like the way you explain it, but I'm laughing because, uh, yeah, um, I, I understand exactly what you're saying in my audience is heard me say that many times so thank you <laughs> oh yeah you know and as i say it's not you don't sign up to be an entrepreneur you're compelled yeah. it yeah. is a compulsion and the consequence is you can't really lead a life that's anything like normal you can't be in a conversation with someone about virtually anything without your mind going back to what else you can or should be doing in the context of your entrepreneurial bent it's um it's horrific it's really uh it, I knew I knew I had a problem when I when my uh, conversation started sounding like my interviews. I'm like, wait a minute, Adam, shut off your interview voice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No. Absolutely. True story. Absolutely. Oh. All right. Well, let, let let me get us back. I, I just I had to get your 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 uh, your um your insight on this, and you did not disappoint. So getting getting us back on track here. So I want to go further into. Um, I don't want to quite skip to um to park city group yet and of course repository track and some of the things you're known for let's let's go a little bit further back to kind of that transition period and maybe where the world was in the in the 90s and as you kind of decided that um after mrs fields cookies like there was a bigger a bigger um opportunity really an opportunity to help and and specifically in the supply chain for food and compliance and safety like can you tell us a little bit more about like what made that area so um ripe for help, if you will. You said data rich, information poor. Like, go a little bit further on that one for me, please. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, w what we found in our own business mm -hmm. was if you could gather information data quickly, yeah. process it quickly, 
and recognize how that data was linked to issues like supply chain or other activities in the business, you could ultimately improve decision making. Yeah. So in a strange way, we concluded that a business is really just a collection of decisions. Hmm. And when that collection of decisions plays itself out, it does better or worse. And our experience was that um, you could significantly improve margins, revenue, but most importantly, customer satisfaction yeah. by getting close enough to the data and the information that um, it shaped the business. Let me, let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Every single customer complaint in the context of Mrs. Fields, everyone, yeah. no exception, got escalated up to Debbie Fields and Randy Fields. Everyone. Wow. Wow. Now, you could argue that stuff like that, just because it's a lot of data and, and information, could in fact be handled at, at, if you will, let's call them lower levels of the organization. Yeah. The problem was that, that, if you will, every customer problem represented something that required senior management. In other words, mm -hmm. was this systemic? Was it an accident? What was the root yeah. cause? And how do you deal with it? So in a way, what we concluded, if you will, early on in the world of Mrs. Fields, and that's certainly carried over since then, yeah. is if you start your business from the perspective of the customer, mm -hmm. and every decision is made in the context of what moves the customer closer to their goal, how they can be successful, even if it's a great cookie, mm -hmm. how do you make that a better overall experience? That gives you a framework in which everything else has to happen. Mm -hmm. So in the world that we looked at, we thought, well, how can we apply this kind of stuff um, yeah. to uh, other industries? Because you know, once, once we had uh, exited Mrs. Fields, the real question was, what's, you know, what's act number two? Yeah. And it struck us that the technology that we had developed, mm -hmm. which helped us operationally, supply chain, et cetera, really gave us enormous decision-making leverage. Um, let, me, let me give you a, a couple of quick examples. Yeah. We, we developed very early on uh, some decisions around the role of people in business. Mm -hmm. And this, I'm sure, sounds peculiar, but here's what we found. Yeah. When we looked at, for example, a store manager or anybody in a decision-making role inside the business, Mm -hmm. we found that they really required two different skill sets. Mm -hmm. They required people skill sets, the ability to motivate people, motivate staff, motivate customers, yeah. just care about people, care. Mm -hmm. But we also realized that they needed another set of decision-making skills that were quantitative. How much should I order? How many should I make? Uh, who should come in on the schedule at what time? Mm -hmm. And what we realized was, my God, um, these are two different skill sets, and the likelihood of finding humans that had both skill sets was pretty small. Yeah. And then we asked a terrible question, which was, why would we be so lucky as we approached, you know, eight, nine hundred stores to think yeah. that we could find eight or nine hundred of the best people in the world to work for us in yeah. the context of having those two skill sets? So we made a strange decision. It turns out it worked out. It was, I think, lucky. We made a decision that you could only likely hire one of those two sets of skills. You could wow. either find great analysts, if you will, who could quantify everything, order perfectly, plan perfectly, mm -hmm. schedule perfectly, et cetera. Or you could find people who had great people skills. We yeah. opted for the latter. So what we did was to say, we're going to automate every single decision in the business that wow. requires the quantification skill set and leave to the human beings the people skill set. Yes. So the, the people would be responsible for the motivation of the staff, the motivation and care of the customers. And we, we put computers. We're probably, if not the first, one of the first companies in the world to put computers in every store. Hmm. Every single store had a system that could take a look at weather trends, traffic trends in the mall, who was adjacent to that store, what the pattern was of interaction, if you will, with... Wow. Uh, mall events and promotions and plan how many of what type of cookie to make for that particular store. Hmm. Um, 
you know, that's extremely difficult short interval forecasting and very few people can do it. On the yeah. other hand, we could find people who are great with people. In fact, interestingly, when we were interviewing people, there was usually one great question at the beginning of an interview, and it was, sing happy birthday to me. What? <laughs> yeah, and about, about half the people we interviewed looked at us like we had three heads. And the, and other, the half, other half were in. Got it, and they started to sing. So which group do you think had the people skills we were looking for? Obviously, oh people who could sing happy birthday without shame. So in a way, we defined that business as a customer-centric business. Yeah. And as many decisions as possible had to involve putting people people in the right slots and automating all of the rest of the decisions. Okay. Fast forward. What we realized is there's lots of industries like that. Hmm. The largest industry in the world, as I mentioned, is retail food in the U.S. Retail yeah. food meaning supermarkets, convenience stores where people buy food, not, not restaurants, but the rest yeah. of food. And that they have the same problem we did taking great care of customers, having products on the shelf, mm -hmm. having the right amount at the right price at the right time. Mm -hmm. So basically we just said, well, this, it's a much bigger industry than we were in, but very similar problem set. How do we begin to create these tools, if you will, these technological tools that will become enablers for humans to do a better job? Yeah. And that's really what we've, what, what we've done over the course of, of time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to sound immodest, but we've we've certainly been uh, quite successful, I think, and our customers mm -hmm. think so, um, at helping them do this kind of stuff. And and the application to supply chain really is, it's pretty mm -hmm. simple, if you think about it. The real job of supply chain doesn't start back on the factory floor. Mm -hmm. It really starts at the retail shelf. So yeah. in other words... Most people did all of their planning on the basis of what was being made and how much it shipped last month. And if you shipped that much last month, you should yeah. ship that much more or this amount this month. But very rarely was it based, and even today, is it actually based on how much is being sold at all of the shelves and retail stores in the United States? Yeah. So what we've done, I think, is, is at least intellectually interesting, which is to reverse the supply chain make it go backwards, start at the shelf, just as we did with our counter, yeah. and work backwards to the point of production. And, and interestingly, as I say, it's the same kinds of problems that we faced in Mrs. Fields, just different items, it wasn't cookies, it's everything from gallons of milk to bananas and deli sandwiches, you name it. All yeah. of those have inherently the same problem. How do you make, well, here's an example. Yeah. If you go into your typical supermarket today, You'll find that for con not for your value as a customer, but rather mm -hmm. for efficiency purposes, whatever the hell that means, they tend to bake most of their bread in the morning. Mm -hmm. Well, who do you know that ever went into a grocery store at 7 a.m. to buy a baguette? Exactly yeah. nobody. Yeah. But it's more efficient to do that. And our argument is, ooh, wrong decision tree. Work yeah. backwards from when do your customers want fresh baguettes Mm -hmm. And then plan your production to achieve that. So yeah. everything in the supermarket industry, uh, from the current out-of-stock mess to uh, mm -hmm. how much to order and, and uh, which vendors to use, all of those kinds of problems uh, yeah. are problems that, in fact, fall in this kind of supply chain space as we see. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to prattle there. No, uh, no, this is great. This is great content, great information. And I guess so the, the thing that comes to my mind as we, you know, as this as we continue in the discussion is in this world of, um, you know, farm to fork and just all these different changes that are happening. Um, where do you see I won't say the problems, let's just say where will you where do you see some of the opportunities in the system, like in terms of like how systemic change. So the, the baguette example was a great example to make it relatable, but there's bigger opportunities out there. Maybe talk a little bit uh, about that, like the system overall. Well, you have to start with it's been broken. It remains yeah. broken. So by definition, the opportunities are really enormous. Yeah. Um, some of them are decisions that were uh, that were made maybe 25 years ago. So let me yeah. let me 
put that on the table and people can reject it or accept it. A few decades ago, Toyota invented a concept called just-in-time inventory. Mm -hmm. And they are the world's masters at it. And the idea is that inventory has a cost, a capital cost of carrying the inventory, uh, an obsolescence cost, uh, all of those kinds of things. So having too much inventory is really a bad idea. Yeah. And what you should have is inventory that arrives as you need it. It makes mm -hmm. perfect sense conceptually. Yeah. Um, it's just, here's the problem. When Toyota did this, they did it in the context of geography, meaning they would build an assembly plant mm -hmm. and they would say to their suppliers, remember how large they were, they were, yeah. uh, the, and now they're the largest automotive company in the world, I believe. They were able to say to their suppliers, we have a great idea. You're going to put your plant on this piece of property. Yeah. So our plant manager can kind of roll out the back door or get on his bike and come see you. Yeah. So in other words, the travel time was minutes, not mm -hmm. months, minutes. Wow. So the idea of just in time makes perfect sense if it's a short distance. Yeah, and from Interestingly, that all, of, all of us as humans innately think that way. If you have a friend that is coming over from next door, mm -hmm. if he was an hour late, if he were an hour late, you'd ask him what the hell happened. Yeah. On the other hand, if he was driving cross country and he was an hour late, you would yeah. go, oh, no big deal. Mm -hmm. So we innately know that distance equals missed time possibilities, that yeah. you're likely to be wrong. Okay. So everybody picked this idea up. It was written in the Harvard Business Review, which mm -hmm. I think was actually uh, an extension of Pravda to undermine capitalism. But anyway, um, great articles, lots of discussion. Supply chain experts said, oh, yeah, yeah, got to go just in time. So we began 25 or 30 years of reducing the size of warehouses, going from multiple sources of a product to a single source to shave yeah. a penny off the cost. And oh, by the way, just remember what the context was, which is why this was so stupid. Hmm. The context was, frighteningly, the cost <laughs> of capital was falling. So it, there was moments in time when costs of capital were double digits. Well, so while we're thinning out inventories because of the carrying costs associated with inventories, the cost of capital was falling to approximately zero. Wow. So in other words, there was nothing to the strategy. The idea was simply yeah. misplaced and wrong, totally wrong. Um, and the reality is that it never should have been done in the first place. Mm -hmm. As capital costs fall, um, it changes how you think about where you should make your investments. So for yeah. example, typical supermarkets years ago would have two months supply in their distribution centers. Now mm -hmm. it's two weeks. And you wonder Which why they're running out of things? Yeah. So nobody has any carrying capacity. And mm. when one guy leaned out his inventory, it concatenated backwards into the supply chain. So nobody has anything. Um, so we just think that was all wrong, pretty much nonsensical. Wow. And it's produced the environment that we're currently in of systemic out of stocks. They're not, uh, it's systemic at this point. It's not yeah. random. It's not caused by a truck, bad weather. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a whole series of horrible sets of, uh, yeah. of decisions that were made. So we're just very much of the opinion that that needs to change and that better forecasting, ordering, mm -hmm. replenishment strategies can massively improve on that. And we do it. Yeah. And Go I ahead. guess taking that, a, taking that a step further. So how does this, and, and maybe just elaborate on like why this is so important to food safety and, like, and why it matters. I don't want to assume people get that part. Yeah, there's. It, we happen to have have a belief, and look, it, it's a belief. I, it's it's not written on stone yeah. tablets anywhere. It's that compliance and safety are part of a supply chain activity. It's not some dominion yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. So you you can't put safety onto a supply chain. It yeah. it doesn't stick. Safety, food safety, mm -hmm. compliance management, all of those activities have to be part of how the supply chain is run. Mm -hmm. And here's why, at least conceptually, here's that 100,000 foot opinion. And it yeah. is just that one man's opinion. 
It's that if you were to say, what's the job of supply chain? The job of supply chain is to optimize the flow of goods mm -hmm. between buyers and sellers. It's really the fundamental job of any supply chain system or, or capability. So the question, and I posed this earlier, how much product is the right amount of product to buy from a vendor who's, whose output is going to kill your customers? And the answer, yeah. well, duh, it's zero. Right? Exactly. I hope but it is. it is part of the decision matrix. It's part of that calculus. Should you, yeah. should you be doing business with this guy? Mm -hmm. So a number of years ago, we partnered with the former Secretary of Health and Human Services under George Bush. His name is Mike Levitt, old and dear friend. Yeah. We partnered with him after he left government mm -hmm. to develop, if you will, the, the safety, compliance, traceability end of the supply chain mm -hmm. of, as it relates to food. Yeah. And interestingly, there was a very sweeping a fundamental change to food safety regulation that occurred under Bush, signed into law by Obama in 2011. Mm -hmm. And the nature of it was to... Uh, completely re-regulate how mm. food is handled, documented, etc. through the supply mm. chain. Interestingly, 10 years later, 10 years, after lawsuits from California and citizens watch groups, etc., the FDA is finally going to do what that law had envisioned, which is to legally require, regulate, that products that are high risk have to be traced Hmm. from dirt to fork, if you will, from farm to fork. Yeah. And that in doing that, we would more quickly be able to identify problems of safety mm -hmm. and more quickly address them. So that's coming into the fore in the next year. Um, and once again, you're going to find that the industry is, for the most part, flat-footed mm -hmm. at the moment in terms of its ability to do that. Mm. And so, and so shifting focus just a little bit. So we, we know some of the issues now. Um, talk a little bit more about um, Park City Group and really how you're working to solve some of these, some of these um, challenges or opportunities that are out there. Good. Um, well, at the end of the supply chain where the customer is, when, what we want is to make sure that when a customer goes into a retail store to buy something, that's actually there. How about that? Yeah. Um, so a big piece of the data analytics that we do and how we help our customers in the supply mm -hmm. chain mm -hmm. is to increase the likelihood that customers won't be disappointed. And here's why. It's, it's pretty frightening. About 25% more or less of Amazon's total North American revenue mm -hmm comes from customers who first went to Amazon because they couldn't find something in a physical store. Yeah. So if the job of food retailing in America is to increase Amazon's business, mm -hmm. uh, boy, I'd give them A plus grades. I was going to say, and, and I'm in the, everybody watching this has been through that. You're in a store, you're looking at something or you want something and you're like, ah, I can't find it. You would you'd get it that moment if it was there. Then you pull exactly. out Amazon and you're like, oh, well, I'll, I'll send it then. Um, and that, exactly. that'll be that. But I, exactly. I, everybody's done that in my opinion. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah. And, and here's what the stats say. Hmm. More than 50% of the time when a consumer goes into a store and he can't find what it was he wanted or she wanted, yeah. They go to a competitor, whether it's Amazon or someone else. Yeah. So it makes no sense to me that that you from a marketing perspective, you would focus on much more than just mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. What if you were the only retailer who was always in stock? Yeah. What if your prices weren't uh, what if toothpaste was a dollar uh, was you know, yeah. priced at a dollar was a penny higher than your competitor? Do you really think You'll lose customers for that. Or more importantly, mm -hmm. are those the customers you care to lose? Yeah, they are. Yeah. What you really want is to be known for, if you want it, we have it. Mm -hmm. So we see this trend, and it's been very good for our business. And, and yeah. so I apologize, this is a bit self-serving. Uh, the reality is that our ability to help people reduce out of stock significantly mm -hmm. is, is an important part of our business. But that backs all the way up into the supply chain. 
Yeah. Because if you start at the shelf and work backwards, mm -hmm. it means that at each node, from the shelf to the back room of the store, from the back room of the store to the distribution center, from the distribution center back to the manufacturers, yeah. in each one of those nodes, you have to get better and better and more and more precise at your forecasting and ordering. And that's what mm -hmm. we do. And so looking, kind of looking one step further on that path, like, so we're, I mean, shelf space, like, like type of products, like SKUs, like how does all, how does all that play into it? Like it a little bit more granular. Yeah. Um, this is sad. Yeah. <laughs> this part of it is actually sad. <laughs> um, over the last 10 or 15 years, consumers have become um, much more fractionated, maybe to use a word here. Yeah. In, in terms of what they want. Mm -hmm. So for example, when I was a child, um, mm -hmm and my mother would take me to the grocery store and we needed mustard. There were three skews of mustard. There was French's mustard, small, mm -hmm. medium, and large. Okay. Yeah. Which do you want? Well, one of our customers is one of the best known retailers in America mm -hmm. today has more than 200 different skews in mustard, 200. Wow. Now That's a lot of mustard types. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, but let's think about how that hurts. This is, it's strange because you would argue, yeah. well, good, good for this retailer. They're following the consumer. Yeah. The consumer wants organic, non-GMO, made in Vermont in somebody's bathtub over a weekend. Okay. Yeah. We've got that one. Uh, but, and we want it in small, medium, and large, and we want it in glass, not plastic containers. Oh, my God. Yeah. So now you've got 25 SKUs of that. Yeah. Um, so what's happened is the industry, because of this skew proliferation of these GMO, non-GMO, organic, natural, local, you name it, all of that, fair traded, et cetera. Yeah. What that has done is to cause the grocery store, the supermarket, to be able to stock less of each one of those. In yeah. other words, if I have 200 skews of mustard, mm -hmm. to have depth on all of that would be millions of dollars of inventory. Yeah. And that's just mustard. So now what? So what's happened is the proliferation of SKUs driven by these uh, unusual consumer uh, desires yeah. is, is driving out of stocks. So what's weird is you may want that uh, mustard from Vermont, yeah, but you your local supermarket probably can't carry it or they only had two bottles and your cousin Frank came in yesterday and he bought them. Yeah. So conceptually the industry in an attempt to, to meet consumer demand mm -hmm. has suffered from a degree of, of skew proliferation that's driving most of their customers out. It's pretty weird. Mm. Half of their customers are going to leave because they can't get what they want. So this will resolve itself in the next few years. You're likely to see um, fewer of those kinds of SKUs. There'll be mm -hmm. uh, the specialty stuff you probably do have to go to Amazon for or someone. But yeah. uh, it's a, it's a d very difficult problem. It's destroyed balance sheets. Mm. Um, and it, although it's made it easier for your audience, entrepreneurs, to figure out, yeah. well, what's the 201th form of mustard that I can yeah. invent? and get on the shelf. Um, mm -hmm. So it certainly helped that entrepreneurial thing in America, but it's just not sustainable. It will, mm. it will. And, uh, and, and the interesting thing here, I like your example, cause it, you know, 200 plus or whatever it is for in terms of mustard. So you're not, we're not going quite back to, you know, the Henry Ford days where you can have any model T color you want as long <laughs> as it's black. So we're not saying that, but we're saying that now through like things like Repositrack and, and Park City Group and the work that's being done, like, you can kind of have the best of both worlds, right? Like if, if, if this is done properly, so you can have the adequate amount, which I'm not claiming I know that, um, amount of mustard to meet your consumer demand to where it's all, it's all logical. So you're not just adding to add and you're not, and you're not diluting maybe that, that um, consumer journey or experience when they enter your doors, right? Bingo. Mm. Now, if you take that notion yeah. And you couple that with changes in the regulatory world now around mm -hmm. traceability. Yeah. Now you've, you've taken an already difficult business. Remember that retail food in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is a very difficult business from a profit perspective. Consumers yeah. may not like the prices they see on the shelf today. That's certainly an issue. 
-hmm. But retailers make one to three percent before taxes. Mm -hmm. So there's very little money in it. Uh, it's a very difficult business to execute well. Yeah. And now there's a regulatory change coming around traceability um, in which the FDA is going to require that huge quantities of records now be kept as products move through the supply chain. Yeah. Uh, and that the creation of those records, the labor, et cetera, um, is about to take an already difficult business and potentially mm -hmm. add a layer to it that, that um, will cause some people to have heartburn would be a would mm. be the best thing that they'll get it, mm. it's really a problem it's, but it's going to happen anyway it's now inevitable so what do you see is um so with, with this new regulation and this new traceability like and let's just say some of the industry or whatever percentage it is kind of being caught flat-footed right not prepared for this like like what do you see happening next like not telling you to have the crystal ball but what, what do you think is going to happen next well this is the proverbial rock in a hard place. And, and yeah, here's what it is, happened. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if you go back to the Food Safety Modernization Act mm -hmm. called FISMA, lovingly, FISMA, as I said, came into existence in 2011. And the yeah. idea was to take high risk foods and, like, think romaine lettuce, et cetera, yeah. and make sure that there was very quick traceability. So when an, an inevitable problem occurred, you could quickly identify the source, track the product back, get it off the shelf, make sure that it wasn't continuing to sicken people. Because today yeah. it takes months. So the question was, what, what does that look like? And here's mm -hmm. what happened. It died. It literally just mm -hmm. died. They, the, the industry pushed back and said it's too expensive. We don't have the technology, yeah. et cetera. So the FDA, for all intents and purposes, backed off the mandate that it had from a regulatory perspective. Mm -hmm. to do traceability. Well, state of California picked up their javelin and threw it and they yeah. went right through the heart of the FDA. So yeah. the FDA signed a consent decree, a legal consent decree after this lawsuit with California and citizens watch groups yeah. that they would bring the regulation as had originally been intended around traceability of high risk foodstuffs. So last year in September, they published the list of things that are going to get tracked and traced. Mm -hmm. They simultaneously announced, oh, by the way, this is just the beginning. We will trace everything eventually, kind of, sort of yeah. a not too subtle hint. And in the course of this year, by the end of the year, they have to publish the rules and regulations around that mm -hmm. list. Wow. So traceability is coming. Nicely enough, now consumers like it. This idea, I hate the word, but let's call it transparency. So consumers like this idea of transparency, traceability, will speed up recalls. We think there's very good economics uh, in the whole issue of, of traceability. So it's coming, but it's going to be a difficult, bumpy road as the industry adopts technologies. Uh, we happen to have, because we're a supply chain company, We've known how to do this for 20 years. We can track, we can track and trace any product. It doesn't have to be the, the ones on the list. Mm -hmm. So we'll be a contender. We think that our technology is, uh, is simple, it's easy, it's so cheap, it's absurd. Yeah. So we, we want to present to the industry our solution, and our solution is one that we think will gain widespread adoption. We've mm. uh, been working with a number of very well-known retailers and wholesalers and they're very pleased with what they see and, and we know how to scale this. We're already highly scaled. So traceability we think is is pretty good for consumers. I don't want to yeah. I don't want to say it's it's amazing. It's it's not it's not amazing. It'll be an, yeah. a nice increment to uh, regulation, a nice increment. Mm. It's time for it to happen. We think the industry's ready. And we're coming to market with a technology that we think is likely to become the dominant technology in, in traceability. So I'm not touting, I'm trying to do that, but we're, we're pretty excited about, about it. Um, yeah. 
And so um, telling us, you know, what you can about the technology, like, like tell us a little bit more about that and like what, what, um, because at the end of this, I'll give you, of course, the opportunity for, um, to leave any, you know, websites or however you want our audience to be able to, to connect with your team. Um, But I want to make sure that the right types of uh, organizations do connect. So what, what are you looking for? What's typically a good, um, you know, a good partner in, in implementing this technology? Well, I think when most people imagined what traceability would look like, they, and look, we're humans. We all tend to do this. Yeah. Uh, I think we all said, oh, wait, we know how to do that. We just have to put a label on everything and right. put a traceability code on it or some screwball thing like blockchain. Don't yeah. get me started on that. <laughs> and uh, as a result, uh, we'll be able to track and trace everything well, the problem yeah. is the people who thought about that had never been in the retail grocery business. Right. Because you can't afford to have a human being every single step scan a case and figure out what the hell's in it. Yeah. In other words, let's see, leaves the farm, scan it. Arrives <laughs> at the packing house, scan it. Leaves the packing house, scan it. Arrives yeah. at the distribution center, scan it. Leaves yeah. the, and so on and so forth. Each one of those scans costs 10 or 15 or 20 cents, yeah. which means uh, only uh, only Midas will be able to afford tomatoes at the end of the supply <laughs> chain. It's a non-starter. The idea is wrong. Yeah. So just like we did thinking the supply chain was backwards, we thought that was kind of a backward idea. The idea is let's take all of the existing technologies that there are today mm-hmm. And let's just extract data from all of them, all of them. We don't care which one anybody's got. Just send us a data dump. Mm -hmm. And we have an interesting technology that can put all of that together, concatenate the records. So we can create an electronic pedigree from Mm -hmm. farm to fork at essentially no cost. So the idea that we have is we're not going to charge retailers for the service. We're not going to charge wholesalers. We're going to charge suppliers, and we're going to charge them a very nominal fee. I mean, you know, we're thinking less than $200 a month, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. All they can wow. eat, as much as they ship, as many customers as they have, unlimited tracking and tracing. Wow. So what we think we've done is, is to, to have a – and look, this is a technology we've had for a decade. It just, yeah. It's just used for a different purpose. Mm-hmm. So we're repurposing – uh, our supply chain technology to do this traceability lot code stuff. And we think the industry's, I'd be surprised if the industry doesn't really look at it and go, wow. In fact, the people we've talked to so far look at it and go, how can you do it that cheap? And the answer is, well, we've already built the technology. That's a mm-hmm. sunk cost. So our costs are really incremental electricity and, and some yeah. people and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I'd like to say we'll take the industry by storm, but that inherently sounds funny. Um, but hopefully this will become an industry standard. Oh, that's, it's exciting stuff, Randy. And I think it's really interesting to me to see, like, just to track your career as we've kind of spoken and think about, like, you know, this started initially when you're pretty young man just getting started as an entrepreneur, figuring out how to, you know, solve the problems of, of you know, cookies, right? Getting those out and, and, and creating that franchise and then now you're tackling like food in the united states essentially and then you're really really working at and solving some of the problems at, at the highest level on the, on the supply chain for food and retail so um I, I think it's just an amazing story so i just have to ask so um so what's next what's next for you what's next for uh, for park city group and and repositrack well you know i'm pretty focused on the here and now. So what's next for the company and therefore for Randy is Mm -hmm. we're spending this whole year getting ready for this traceability initiative that's going to be mandated this year. It'll happen in November, maybe Mm -hmm. sooner. And, you know, we're, we've cleared the deck of obstacles and, and pieces of the business that we think were in the way, because when this, when people wake up one morning and they see the published regulations, they're going to need a solution. They're going to need a solution they can adopt quickly and inexpensively. And it's certainly our hope that we will be that. You know, there's no certitude to it, but yeah. I'm hopeful that our business reputation and 
uh, our ability to to scale. I mean, we already process, I don't know, just 15 to 20 million transactions a day of this yeah. sort. So we're capable of doing what the industry mm -hmm. needs. And I think the question is, um, you know, how how that all plays out over the next several years. We're certainly optimistic about how we'll, how we'll be impacted. Um, and we think it'll be good for the industry as well. How can people that are, uh, that are watching this and want to learn more um, follow up to connect with you, you and your team uh, to learn more? Well, probably our uh, websites, we have two, parkcitygroup.com and repositrack, R-E-P-O-S-I-T-R-A-K. C K track no T R A K how's that repositrack.com uh, that's the product set mm -hmm. um, and there's plenty of ways to contact us if, if people are interested they can even reach out to me how's that mm -hmm. perfect and we'll put we'll put all those links and stuff uh, website links and whatnot in the uh, in the show notes so that our audience can just uh, head right on over and and check out what you're working with and, and connect with you and your team. And uh, to the audience, if this is the first time uh, connecting or listening to Mission Matters, just so you know, we're a platform that's all about um, really amplifying the messages of uh, mission-based entrepreneurs, executives, and experts, people that are out there making a difference and are really going out into the market and, and doing great things. So if that's the kind of content that um, you're interested in, we invite you to hit that subscribe button because we have many more mission-based uh, individuals coming on the line and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Randy, really, this has been a, a great episode and interview, and it was a pleasure having you on the this, on this show to learn more about, of course, your story, the story you have in business, and to get your insight to an entrepreneurship. So thanks again for coming on. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate the opportunity.